Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with David Talbot. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Can you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Uh, of course. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm David Talbot. I'm the author of The Devil's Chessboard, uh, which is a book about the CIA, Alec Dulles in particular, and the Cold War, and also uh, the author of Brothers, both of which were New York Times bestsellers. Brothers looked at Bobby Kennedy, the Attorney General, under his brother, President Kennedy, and his uh, suspicions about what happened to his brother in Dallas and his private investigations into the murder and the assassination of his brother before he himself was killed and of course in 1968 when we talk about dulles what made you want to write a book about dulles i mean he's one of these names that gets mentioned out of the few list of names of people that are tied in with the kennedy assassination whether they were part of the plot to do so and i've tried to look at documents but i keep seeing his name pop up in all these random spots where i'm like why is he involved in this and why is he involved in this and you start realizing he's involved in almost every single thing that you could really pull back a string to see if there's a curtain of bad behind it yeah i you know became fascinated not only with alan dallas but the assassination of president kennedy uh itself uh, when I was uh, quite young, when I was 12 years old, when it happened. And uh, I, I, w I guess it haunted me ever since, like 9-11 haunted uh, a new generation. Uh, my sons, who are in their, uh, one's 28, one's 31. Um, and they were kids when 9-11 happens. I was 12 years old when President Kennedy was killed in Dallas. And uh, I think it traumatized me and traumatized the entire nation in some way. Um, and the echoes continued. Um, when I be became a journalist and historian, I wrote a book called Brothers about Bobby Kennedy's, as I said, search for the truth about what really happened in uh, Dallas to his brother. And um, the name Alan Dallas kept popping up even then. Uh, early in the 2000s, as I did my research on that book. It was Peter Dale Scott, who's another grand old man of the uh, Kennedy research field, uh, retired professor at UC Berkeley, who first put confirmed for me the idea that Dulles was somehow central to the plot against Kennedy. Dulles, of course, uh, came up uh, for Peter when he was a young professor at Berkeley. He was invited to to uh, attend a dinner at the Hoover Institution, uh, which is a right-wing institution affiliated with Stanford. And at this uh, conclave of people back in 19, early 1963, uh, there was a lot of complaints, conservative complaints, as there is today about President Biden from the right. And they were all very conservative people at this dinner party. Peter had been a diplomat in Poland, and he'd been invited uh, to this dinner, uh, and they thought he was one of them. Uh, he later became quite uh, liberal in his views. Uh, but at the time, he was astounded by the, the kind of ferocity. And, and, and finally, uh, a cleric from Eastern Europe, anti-communist, uh, who was kind of the alpha male in the room, spoke up and said, silence the old man will take care of it. And Peter at the time thought the old man was Joe Kennedy, the patriarch of the Kennedy family. But I knew that he had a stroke by then and he wasn't able to take care of it much of anything. He was uh, reduced uh, to a wheelchair. He was speaking very uh, silently, uh, very sparingly. And uh, the old man was really a reference to Alan Dulles. That was his nickname within the CIA culture. The old man will take care of it. Well, that triggered for me when, when Peter told me that over lunch one day, uh, you know, the story that it was Alan Dulles who was the key figure in the plot against President Kennedy. Alan Dulles had served under President Eisenhower and then Kennedy as the director of the CIA. 
He was a man who was very powerful, very connected uh, in military worlds, in the national security worlds, in Wall Street. He had been, he'd served uh, under his brother, John Foster Dulles, uh, uh, at Sullivan Cromwell, which is the most important, most powerful law firm on Wall Street. Uh, so he was a man with his fingers throughout the world of the power elite in, in Washington and New York and so forth. And he, I realized, not only had the uh, means to bring down President Kennedy, but a motive. He had been fired by President Kennedy after the disastrous CIA invasion of Cuba, the Bay of Pigs in 1961. He had a grudge against President Kennedy. And more important, the people he served, the powerful men like the Rockefeller brothers, uh, Douglas Dillon, who was another Wall Street guy who was Secretary of Treasury and a Republican under Kennedy. These men decided that President Kennedy was a threat uh, not only to the national security of this country, because he was trying to make peace with the Soviet Union and with uh, Castro in Cuba at the time, but also to their racket, uh, their, their basic uh, the way they were making money, not only through the military industrial complex, but through his uh, efforts to uh, plug tax loopholes for the oil industry and his efforts to crack down on the uh, steel industry and so forth, they thought Kennedy was an enemy uh, of their interests and he had to be removed from power. I think they did so violently in Dallas. And as I enumerate in my book, The Devil's Chessboard, I do think Alan Dallas was the key figure, not only in the operation to kill Kennedy, but in the cover-up of the crime. But of course, because of course he lobbied strenuously to get on the Warren Commission, which was the official inquiry into uh, President Kennedy's assassination. And it should have been called, according to many people who have uh, observers at the time, the Dulles Commission instead of the Warren Commission, because he was so active on the commission. And he made sure that it was pinned on the hapless patsy, as he called himself, Lee Harvey Oswald, rather than, of course, a wide conspiracy. When it comes to Dulles, I referenced the uh, point in when I first got interested into the assassination after Oliver saw a new film came out, which was that interview when someone asked him, has he ever done anything bad in his life? And he just lights his pipe and goes, no, like in the most sarcastic, smug way where like my gut was telling me this is a bad guy. But then I was like, well, we can't go off gut feelings. Let's try and find documents. And you start finding out with documents. I mean, for me, my thing to them was with the Bay of Pigs was Kennedy was just the person that said no and they were so used during Eisenhower's administration to getting their way for so long that's why Kennedy made that famous speech talking about he wanted he doesn't think he's in charge of these institutions and at the same time he was trying to reduce them their funding their covert capabilities and things that he thought they shouldn't have with this idea of plausible deniability oh the president shouldn't know about it because he needs to be deniable on anything that you know could be evidence of what we're doing over there and it's like well you guys were so used to getting your way that eventually you just thought you could do whatever you wanted and not have to pass it by the president. And that's where I found documents on Dulles where he had 13 American soldiers captured um, and by Castro that were trying to raid some boat called the Amigo. And then Castro makes this interview that everyone remembers saying that this is the interview that Lee Harvey Oswald saw that caused him to want to shoot the president. It's no, well, it makes sense when you look at him blame Castro blaming JFK because he thinks, oh, the president must be in charge of these forces. But that's not the answer at all. Dulles was in charge of these forces, all these individual actors that were going without the president's even say so. They were just doing things on their own. I mean, they were so invested into Cuba before he, JFK even got into office. And you start looking at all these things where I start finding weight behind everything that everybody's saying. But when it comes to the point where it would cause him to be this master plan or master schemer to assassinate the president. Where are the steps in there? I mean, is there a certain marking or he's meeting and he's like, maybe I can spark up fake Castro uh, resistance people to go shoot Kennedy or something like that? Because all the blame gets put on a 24 year old. And that's a lot. And there's not really a whole lot of evidence with weight that can go to pinning Oswald. I mean, he was wrapped up in 40 something hours by Jack Ruby. Yeah, you, well, you've raised a lot of important questions. Um, Arthur Schlesinger, who was the uh, noted historian uh, who served in the Kennedy White House as an aide, uh, told me uh, when I was researching my first book, Brothers, uh, that we didn't control our own government. 
The hairs on the back of my neck stood up when I heard that. Here he's saying the president of the United States doesn't control his own government. He didn't control the CIA, the Pentagon, or even the State Department. So who did control these institutions? Dulles, as we now know, uh, was able to seed much of the government with his own people. Even William, uh, even McGeorge Bundy, who was a national security advisor to uh, Kennedy in the White House, was a Dulles man. So he had snakes within his own garden, within the uh, White House. Uh, Kennedy, the Kennedy administration, according to those I interviewed in the book, and I interviewed just about everyone who was still alive at the time, Robert McNamara, Theodore Sorensen, Arthur Schlesinger, as I said, uh, Teddy Kennedy. Uh, the Kennedy presidency was uh, a circle that was beleaguered from the very beginning, certainly from the Bay of Pigs on in April 1961, and was a smaller and smaller presidency. It was uh, besieged from all sides. And and Alan Dulles, when he was fired and forced out of power, Kennedy did so very politely. He gave him medals and so on, but he sent him packing and he was stunned by this Dulles because he was used to being the one in power. He and his brother, John Foster Dulles, who served as Secretary of State under President Eisenhower. When, when Alan Dulles was forced out of the CIA in November 61, did he go quietly into the night? No. He went back to Georgetown, where he lived in Washington, and continued to operate as if he were still running the CIA. People came to him like Richard Helms, top CIA, uh, CIA deputies, James Angleton, Howard Hunt. They continued to report to him as if he were still director of the CIA. The guy that Kennedy replaced him with was, uh, was a nice uh, guy, a Republican businessman from California. Uh, John McCown, and he didn't really know about the CIA culture. He didn't know what was happening under uh, his own roof. And so the real, I think, director of the CIA continued to be Alan Dulles, despite the fact that he was fired by Kennedy. Where was he on the weekend? Uh, President Kennedy was killed in Dallas, and then Lee Harvey Oswald was silenced forever by a mafia errand boy uh, named Jack Ruby. He was, this is Alan Dulles, at the farm, which was a CIA in, uh, uh, you know, very top secret CIA facility in Northern Virginia. What the hell was Alan Dulles doing there? He'd been fired from the CIA uh, over two years before. So, uh, you know, these are the, the kind of key questions that were never investigated, certainly not by the Warren Commission because Alan Dulles served on the Warren Commission but by the corporate or mainstream media to this day is some 60 years later. Uh, this is still a crime against democracy, not only against the Kennedys and their family, but against democracy that the American people have a right to know about. The CIA is still withholding documents that are relevant to the case uh, against uh, federal law. Uh, they just, just they told President Trump uh, when he was president that uh, they, it was against their interests, against national security to release these documents. Uh, they're still covering up. Uh, to this day, the, the, the CIA is still covering up their crime. I tried to think when people mentioned to me that Kennedy's problem was that he didn't clean house. And I was like, what does that mean? And then I started to realize that how long had Dulles been in the CIA? And then you start looking, he obviously made connections with people. I mean, if you're out of the CIA allegedly for two years, but people are still coming to you for advice on things. What you can pull from that is he's like, yeah, I'm, I, I'm technically fired, but give it like a week or give it a month or give it until whatever this happens and I'll be back. And that's when we have the establishment of the Warren Commission, where it was basically a fox investigating the chicken house and um, Oliver Stone's words. And it's just like with the Warren Commission, my biggest problem was if you look at what the job of it would have been, would have been investigating the death of President Kennedy. But if you read it, it's not that at all. It's here's the guy who did it, Oswald, and we're going to show you how he did it. And I'm like, they were thorough. I have to give them that. I looked over a lot of it. It's very thorough, but it was thorough in the sense that it was over thorough as in we're going to talk to the sister who moved two states over who was twice removed from the family of the cousin who shot and it's just like why are you talking to that person it doesn't make sense but there's a lot where i start going how bad is our our central intelligence agency what are all the operations that are going on and i bring it back to the example of one person who blew the whistle on it all and that was um william colby 
who exposed Operation Chaos, exposed a bunch of stuff. And it's the best reference point. So whenever we talk about documents that are being destroyed, he mentions it all. He talks about we, we don't have uh, you know issues on that because it was destroyed in this and it was destroyed in that or it's not our document. It's somebody else's document. Then they have to go for confirmation to that person. But Dulles was just a bad guy. But to make the overall call on killing Kennedy and then people bring up the idea that it was part of the oil companies that did it as well, too. And I was like, I bet you there's a connection there, but only that he was getting a kickback. He must have been getting some money on the side that we're not seeing. Well, Dulles was a very powerful figure in, the, in what we call today the deep state. I think the deep state, particularly since 9-11, has uh has metastasized is quite a bit broad, uh, bigger, more sprawling. Uh, the national security complex there, Alan Dulles couldn't operate with the power uh, today that he had back then during the Cold War. But it was a much smaller world than the world of power in America, and he was able to operate, I think, quite uh, aggressively. He did so the only on, on behalf, at the behest of his clients. He wasn't some rogue agent. I don't want to portray him that way. He was very much in touch with the Rockefeller brothers, as I said, with men like the Douglas Dillon, who was a Wall Street guy who was in Washington serving under President Kennedy and then Eisenhower earlier. Um, so he checked in with these people through con uh, very elite conclaves like the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, the, the group of, of, of men, mostly men in those days, that would gather in New York and work out policy that later became official policy of the U.S. So they had their clubs, they had their associations, they would meet with them. I, I really urge all of you to read uh, C. Wright Mill's book, The Power Elite, from uh, the uh, late 50s, early 60s, to see how power functioned in those days. Uh, he was a very noted Columbia sociologist, uh, and it was the best-selling book of the day, The Power Elite. So Alan Dulles was acting on behalf of his board of directors, his sponsors, his patrons, very wealthy, powerful men who decided, as I said earlier, Kennedy was uh, inimical to their interests and had to be removed. Um, the way he did it, to answer your earlier question, was he brought home the killing team under William Harvey, who was another CIA agent who was in charge of killing Castro at one point, run the mafia to try to do that. William Harvey, Bill Harvey hated the Kennedys, was, uh, I, I think, uh, the top assassin within uh, the CIA, had been given medals by the CIA for his work, uh, was head, ostensibly the Rome station of the CIA then. He'd been uh, uh, squired, uh, you know, squirreled away there by Dick Helms at the CIA and others, Angleton, to protect his career because he knew they knew the Kennedys hated him, Bobby and, and, and GFK. So he was supposedly in Rome, but he was spotted by his deputy in Rome, Mark Wyatt, heading on a plane to Dallas in, in the weeks before the assassination. When Mark Wyatt asked Bill Harvey why he was going there, he said, just to look around. I think what Harvey did was under uh, Dulles's command was to bring the killing team that he used in different foreign operations back to Dallas to kill the president of the United States. We know from Howard Hunt's deathbed confessions, another CIA, uh, notorious CIA official, that he was part of meetings uh, that held in Southern Florida of CIA guys, disgruntled uh, right-wing Cubans, anti-Castro Cubans and so on, to kill the president. We know that Howard Hunt was probably involved in some way, that Bill Harvey was central to it. These were the team that reported to Alan Dulles. So I think Alan Dulles brought his killing team back to Dallas to kill the president of the United States. And then he was central in the cover-up as a member of the Warren Commission. When it comes to people relating uh, Johnson or Hoover to also a plot to know the assassination or part of the assassination attempt, do you think that that's plausible or do you think they might have been coerced by Alan Dulles? Because, I mean, if Alan Dulles gets hired right back in, is he do you see like a, a, a point, I would say, where he starts doing weird things or things that are out of line or things that are seen as bad moves? Like, does he come back natural like nothing happened or is there like a wait time before he starts doing things that you would call like? I don't know, bravado acts, I would say. Or traitorous, uh, treasonous. Uh, I, I think Alan Dulles was a traitor, um, traitor to democracy, a traitor to this country. 
and he should go down in infamy, he and his brother both. The name Dulles should be removed from the uh, Washington International Airport, Washington, DC. Uh, it's a disgrace that it's named after his brother, John Foster Dulles. Um, and I think the name should be Martin Luther King uh, International Airport instead. But uh, as I've argued, I think Dulles uh, brought in people into the plot who he thought could stay quiet and, and were effective. I think uh, Lyndon Johnson, the vice president under President Kennedy, had to be told ahead of time what was going to happen on his turf in Texas. He was part of that parade, of course, that day in uh, Dallas. He was quite afraid because he thought he was not in charge of the plot. He was tipped off, I think, ahead of time that it was about to happen. Alan Dulles visited him on, his, on the LBJ ranch in Texas ahead of the assassination. I think he was given prior knowledge of the operation, but he was not central to it as Roger Stone and others have argued. It was not a Lyndon Johnson operation. It was an Alan Dulles operation. I think Del uh, Johnson was afraid for his life because he was not a courageous man on Air Force One. During the return trip, Bill Moyers, his deputy, asked him why he was staring out the window. He said he wondered when the missiles were gonna start flying. He thought the assassination of President Kennedy was uh, the trigger for a nuclear war uh, with Castro and, or Soviet Union or both. Uh, he was huddling Johnson in a bathroom on Air Force One when they were, before they took off from Dallas to go back to Washington. And a military attache found him there. He was a coward, LBJ. And I don't think they wanted to bring him in to play a central role in the plot. But of course, he benefited hugely from the assassination by becoming president. Instead of being the scandal-ridden vice president he was before and possibly being forced off the ticket in 64. I don't think J. Edgar Hoover, another Kennedy hater, he hated Bobby Kennedy, who was attorney general, his boss. Uh, he called him very uh, coldly that, uh, to inform him that the president had been shot and he was, he had died in Dallas. Uh, he hated the Kennedys. And from that day on, Bobby lost his power as attorney general. The FBI under Hoover wouldn't uh, enforce his, his orders and so on. And Bobby knew this. Uh, Hoover was a Kennedy hater, but I, again, don't think he was central to the plot. He was to the cover-up because he wanted to make sure the FBI was taken care of and, 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 and look good. Uh, that was always his number one uh, goal in life. But I don't think Hoover was one of the main plotters uh, in the actual assassination. Again, uh, fingers point to the CIA and Alan Dulles. Well, maybe I might be wrong here because I'm looking back at documents because I wasn't alive around this time, but it seemed to me like Johnson was a bit of a pushover. Um, the reason why I say that is directly after Kennedy's assassination, maybe why also Hoover went also with the cover up was the FBI, the CIA and all these institutions, their power increased dramatically. I mean, compared to what it was before, I mean, Alan Dulles was busier than ever. I mean, the threat to communism, even with some of the people that think that there was, I think when the report came out, the 1095, 360, they talked about 47% of people thought that there was conspiracy behind it. And then you're looking at the documents from the FBI agents and also CIA agents that are also saying they think that there's conspiracy involved. Everyone's thinking communism. And I was like, well, how big of an issue was communism? So then I'm looking through documents and I come across J. Edgar Hoover's file on the FBI.gov. And it leads into the Hollywood 10 when they started hiring agents to investigate Hollywood. And then they have Walt Disney as an FBI informant. And I'm like, all right, so their powers increased. It didn't go back down. They weren't laying low. They started doing other things in the name of defending America against communism. And I start having this I, 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 have, I have this thought where I'm like, so if Johnson, people blame as being the person that killed Kennedy, I'm like, well, he's definitely part of the cover up. I think you can definitely prove that. But I think it's these individual actors that we talk about and that the fear of that is that if they run an agency, then where does that agency go? Does it go on the right path or does it go on the wrong path? And I haven't gotten into the RFK assassination yet. It's going to be later down the road. I'm not done with JFK. I don't know if I'll ever be done, but. When I'm looking, you know, eventually you're searching through JFK documents, I've came across that couple that were Bobby's. And I'm like, why does it seem so damn similar? Like there's just 
there's like a, it's like smelling a wine. I'm picking up notes of JFK in this, and you start realizing they might have just evolved the methods that they used prior. And I think if you even reach back farther, look into the Castro assassination attempts, people always say if it was the government that wanted to kill JFK, why didn't they just kill him in his sleep? And I go, well, it was a little bit more than that. It was kind of like, I mean, this, the amount of slander that came out about JFK, about affairs and all these things that was in media tabloids afterwards, people forgot about a person died. I mean, that's the best way to really destroy someone is not only them, but their reputation. Make sure anything that they say doesn't get remembered and people only remember the tabloid journalism. Well, of and of course, the way they killed President Kennedy was so dramatic, blowing his head off uh, on the streets of a major American city at high noon, splattering his brains and his body matter all over his wife. Uh, she said she wouldn't take off her Chanel suit that day because she wanted to see what they had done to her husband. Uh, so it was done with quite, uh, quite coldly and I think with contempt for him, for his family, for the country. Uh, now, you raise the question, who benefited from the assassination? Of course, Pre President Johnson did, because it, it put him in the Oval Office. But you have to go behind President Johnson to see who really benefited. And as you were raising the issue, uh, it was the military industrial complex. They got their war in Vietnam because President Johnson was installed in the White House. President Kennedy was, was, was already withdrawing troops, advisors from Vietnam. He would not have had an all-out war there. He would have de-escalated and withdrawn U.S. troops. He, Robert McNamara, his Secretary of Defense, told me that personally during my interview with him. So, uh, you know, who benefited from the assassination was number one, the military industrial complex, all the corporate forces that Kennedy had declared war on, and particularly the military industrial forces. You know, they were behind LBJ's rise to political power. Companies like Brown and Root and LTV, all the military contractors in Texas, they benefited hugely from the Vietnam War. They built helicopters, they built guns, they built uh, missiles and so forth. Um, they were all used in the Vietnam War. This country's business is war. It has been ever since uh, the Cold War began, since World War II. Uh, men make huge amounts of money from the blood of war. That's the fact of America. And Kennedy tried to stop that. He tried to stop the Cold War. He was interested in diplomacy. He tried to open a channel. He did open back channels with Nikita Khrushchev in Moscow and with Fidel Castro in Havana. Uh, he wanted to de-escalate the nuclear war, the Cold War, because he was deathly afraid of a nuclear Armageddon, just like World War I, breaking out uh, through mistakes. Uh, and that's why uh, he ran for president. Ted Kennedy told me that his younger brother and Ted Sorensen, his speechwriter, told me that he ran for the presidency because he was afraid of a nuclear war breaking out. He prevented one over Cuba during the October missile crisis in October 62. Uh, that was, I think, in some ways his finest moment because all his military advisors, all his national security people, he was the only one besides his brother Bobby uh, in the room, in the cabinet room, arguing for peace with Cuba, a diplomatic solution to the nuclear showdown uh, in October, 1962. That's amazing that he was able as president to do that. If Nixon had been president, we would have a nuclear war because we now know that there were nuclear uh, missiles aimed at the US from Cuba that were on Cuban soil. So there would have been a, an exchange of nuclear fire as Robert McNamara and others in the Kennedy administration later learned from talking to uh, Soviet, their Soviet counterparts at conferences uh, in the 1980s and 90s. So I think it was, uh, you know, Kennedy was a hero, a martyr. Uh, and I argue for that, uh, uh, you know, in my books, Brothers and Devil's Chessboard, because again and again, he would stand up to the forces of war when they wanted to, uh, you know, basically incinerate most of the world. Curtis LeMay, who was head of the Air Force, was out of his mind, as President Kennedy said. The man was out of his mind. He thought you could actually fight and win a nuclear war. Uh, 20 million, 30 million casualties were nothing to him. American casualties. Uh, if we had, uh, we declared, 
could declare victory at the end of that nuclear exchange. So these were the kind of men that President Kennedy was up against. Did anybody ever do a psych evaluation on Dulles? No, but he should have been. I, I think he was a high functioning psychopath. Uh, and of course, many people in power are. Uh, well, he's like the common military guy in a movie with the giant cigar. Launch the nukes, launch the nukes. And I'm just like, hey, does anybody like, I mean, I question that guy in the room. I'm, I know we don't want him in charge of our military, but that seems to be the, always the iconic Hollywood military general. I mean, this guy wants was, war. He was not like Curtis LeMay, who was more brusque and, and, and was the, uh, you know, role model for, I think, uh, General Buck Turgis and, and Dr. Strangelove. Uh, Dulles was more charming, you know. He was able to uh, swan around and go to cocktail parties and and uh, dazzle people with his chatter. He had uh, di different uh, mistresses and so on, as I write about in, in the Devil's Chessboard. Although he was married uh, for most of his life to the same woman, Clover, um, so he was he could be very charming, a high functioning psychopath, I call him. But at the same time, he bragged about the kind of power he had, the power to end life human life and uh you know he would tell his mistresses uh they were like white mice the, pe the people who fell into his traps and he liked seeing their little necks broken so uh i think he was a psychopath i think he got pleasure from these people suffering and uh their demise and the power that he had over them often um but i think he could also be when he needed to be very charming and very avuncular and, and very uh gracious personality he was not just a you know obviously sick despotic creature uh it was that's what made him so dangerous i think that he was able to operate on both levels when it comes to the, I guess, the appointed Warren Commission, did you notice Dulles doing anything when that was appointed, like with uh, the media, for instance? I always tried to wonder what was media influence back then. It seemed like the very, what I would call the best time for information on the assassination was day one. As much as there was speculation, I mean, there was NBC reports of like, the president's still alive, he's in critical condition. I mean, there was a lot of speculation going on, but eventually right after that happened there just became immediate like all one narrative and that's where i thought we lost track of what the truth would be and i start seeing videos of dulles speaking with reporters where he's like you'll find out in the official report not saying a whole lot but there's definitely you can tell notes of muscling i would say well look uh jan winter himself who's uh the the founder and, and the publisher of rolling stone magazine jan was a friend he was on my board at salon when i Grand Salon uh, magazine, uh, one of the first dot com periodicals. Jan told me, oh, if there was a conspiracy against President Kennedy, someone would have talked. Of course, that was the title of, of uh, Larry Hitchcock's book. Uh, you hear that over and over again. Well, a lot of people did talk, and they were silenced forever in, in some cases. Uh, gangsters who were about to testify to the House Assassinations Committee, like Johnny Roselli, Sam Giancana, were executed uh, brutally. Uh, others were about to talk and and also uh, were silenced. It was dangerous, actually, to speak out about the Kennedy assassination if you knew something, particularly before the House Assassinations Committee, which, by the way, was the last official word on the assassination. The House Assassinations Committee in 1979 found that President Kennedy was the likely victim of a conspiracy. That is the final official word, not the Warren report. So, uh, but that's been forgotten by history down deep well. Look, the corporate media in this country is a lapdog, a lapdog of power. Whether it's uh, the Kennedy assassination or the Gulf of Tonkin resolution that got us into Vietnam, or the war, uh, the weapons of mass destruction (WMD) that got us into Iraq, the war there that was such a disaster, or 9/11. One national security kind of uh, debacle after the next has been covered up by the corporate media, or actually even advocated by the corporate media. Then I'm talking about the New York Times, the Washington Post, the so-called liberal media, I think goes along again and again with the national security line in this country. And they certainly have been culpable in the cover-up of the assassination of President Kennedy. To this day, 60 days later, the New York Times, the Washington Post won't touch it. In fact, the Washington Post book editor told my book publicist when The Devil's Chessboard came out back in 2015, we won't touch this book with a 10-foot pole. 
That's an exact quote from the Washington Post book review editor. So the, the media likes to think in this country that they're open to free speech and, and they have a diversity of opinion. It's such hogwash. I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist all my life. I know how the sausage gets made. And I'm here to tell you the corporate media in this country is some of the worst when it comes to uh, the most, I think, dark secrets about this country. The corporate media goes along with the cover up. In Alan Dulles' case, they were friends with him. They hung out together. They went to the same parties, the same clubs. They belonged to the same clubs. I'm talking about the publisher of the Washington Post, of Newsweek, the editors of the New York Times. They called him Ali, the publisher of the New York Times. They had nicknames for him. They, they thought he was great. He helped direct the coverage, the media coverage of the Warren Report. We know that from his own personal letters that I uh, wrote about in The Devil's Chessboard. The, the editors of Newsweek thanked him for, their, for his direction of their coverage, uh, for, uh, cover story coverage of the Warren Report. Uh, this is corrupt to me. This is not journalism. It's, uh, I don't know what it is, propaganda. Uh, well, look so at all the testimonies that were out and even the statements we have to all the news corporations about not going against the official statements of the Warren Commission. I mean, there's a lot of fe I would say that they were coerced in a sense of two ways. One fear of going to war with Russia or Cuba. Um, that was in a lot of people. They were always mentioning, well, if you don't say it like this, then we might go to war with Russia or Cuba. But then also the expert witnesses and all these people they got classic interviews with all because they were agreeing with the official narrative. I mean, the government basically was like, here you go. Here's this witness that was there. And they'll say exactly what we want them to say. And here's an interview for them. So there was no incentive to go against the mainstream. That's right. And, and, and even to this day, six decades later, the corporate media is still uh, pursuing the same line still treats uh, people like myself as crazy conspiracy theorists uh, when they are the ones who are crazy, I believe in believing that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. And to th hang under the threadbare Warren report at this point, six, dec uh, six decades later, to me is journalistic malpractice. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, sticking your head in the sand. I mean, they don't want to know what 60 years of research, independent research by people like me and Oliver Stone and dozens and dozens of other citizen researchers, authors, investigators have found. Uh, they don't want, they never report on those findings. Um, so I, I think they're as big a part of the problem as the uh, government itself. When it, I mean, even look at Oliver Stone. I mean, Oliver Stone's an award-winning producer of many great films, and he had to go overseas to get his De Destiny Betrayed uh, film out there. The UK, I think it was Showtime that finally picked him up. But I mean, everything that we see on media, it's either a book like Case Closed or it's something where there is no conspiracy involved in it. And I'm like, how does it last this long that nobody – like I see Flat Earth documentaries that are getting mentioned where I'm like, how does this not get like mentioned at all, any of these new – evidence-based or people what they would label conspiracy there is conspiracy there and the weight there's a lot of weight behind the words that they say there's a lot of evidence and claims that should be looked into or highlighted on news that aren't being highlighted and i think it could it be grandfathered in i mean could this be just something like a long old deal that's been going on for a very long time where people say i won't touch it with a 10-foot pole only because it's so old and it's so solidified i'd say that it would be like stepping on a a web Look, Oliver, by the way, is still trying to get a, a, a Hollywood film made about uh, JFK to this day, and he's meet, meeting with resistance in Hollywood over that. I found so, documents on him on the FBI website about Platoon, the movie that he made, because I had a guest on talk about the military's influence in the media, and they had a thing on Oliver Stone saying, do not fund Oliver Stone's movie. It's going to make the United States military look weak and corrupt, and it's just like – I, that's small stuff. And we could say there's small scale propaganda and there's large scale propaganda and brainwashing people. Like if you watch the movie Lone Survivor, I watched it. I felt patriotic and I am a patriot at heart, but I also want to stop corruption. I don't like 
evil. And that doesn't matter. I don't have a side on this. I don't have a side whether I'm a lone nutter or conspiracy theorist. I, re I recognize evil. I actually, um, I'm on the education forums on the JFK community, and I put up a thing about Bugulosi and his secret love child that he had. And I was like, it's weird how this guy writes a book about JFK that agrees with the official narrative. And someone commented like, just like a conspiracy theorist to say this. Nope. I also posted an article about Mark Lane involved in Jonestown. I was just like, hey, like, I don't have a side here. I'm just recognizing weird weird things and as the a, a human being as the public we should just question weird things the idea that our individual thoughts they're ours right well no they're not because they're influenced by everything that we see and everything that we see in media will say that's a conspiracy don't look into it that's a bad person don't get near that and you start realizing everything that you think is right could actually be wrong and it's the most mind shattering thing whenever i mention my favorite topic which is mk ultra and everybody goes that's a conspiracy no it's not we don't have documents on a lot of it they destroyed it and it, you start to find out like i found out uh dallas's son who came back from war from a brain injury was also he offered him up to be part of mk ultra i'm like that's a bad guy i mean we have accounts of people jumping out of an 11 story building frank olson high on lsd even though the week prior he said they're going to get rid of me i mean i came across files on the fbi website that's um it's harvey and in on, on next to harvey's name in parentheses it says weak link then you find out he dies later i mean this is stuff where people would say conspiracy. It's horrible stuff. You don't want your government doing this, but I rather well, know and Americans correct it. Are, American and American media has been uh, been taught to be naive. Don't wake the children. Don't tell them. Uh, you know they don't want to know the truth. President de Gaulle in France said this years ago about the Kennedy assassination. Assassination. They won't know. They don't want to know the truth. Meaning the people in power, and and, and they they treat us uh, the citizens like children. So we can see uh, even on masterpiece theater, they censor parts of the uh, uh, shows that they see in Europe because they think the American audience is too uh, uptight to watch this. Um, I think uh, it's long since then the children began to wake up, and we began to question authority. And uh, you know we don't listen to the gatekeepers anymore, and that's why there's been a proliferation of a media on the left and right, uh, people's media that tells people the truth and sometimes distorts the truth because there are some bad actors out there in social media too, as you know. Uh, but corporate media is losing control of the narrative, and that's all for the better, I think. Uh, but the erosion, I'm a patriot too. I believe in this country. I'm like you. And I believe that we need to restore this country to its founding principles in many cases. And I think what we've seen since the assassination of President Kennedy some six decades ago is an erosion in, in, belief in government or in belief in government authority. And I think that's not an altogether good thing. I believe that we should actually support our government uh, when it's called for. But if you lie to repeatedly, as we've been, from Vietnam to Watergate to the invasion of Iraq to 9-11 and so on, uh, you know, Iran-Contra, one national security kind of defining moment after the next, then you began to lose faith in, in the people who are in power. And I think uh, the people in power include the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the top media uh, organizations in, in this country, they are part of the problem. They have to be actually also told what is true. And they're kicking and screaming to this day about the truth, what really happened to President Kennedy in Dallas. That's outrageous to me. And uh, the fact that they won't review my books, that they blacklist me and all people like Oliver Stone is outrageous. So look, we just, it's Scoop Nisker, who was an underground radio guy out here for years in San Francisco, used to have a saying, if you don't like the news, go out and make some of your own. That's what we have to do. That's why I started Salon back in 1995. It was one of the first dot-com uh, publications. It was to tell the truth, because I knew that the corporate media was evading the truth. So I'm glad that you're doing your podcast. We, we'll get the truth out there one way or the other. Are you scared? What happens if the truth does come out and you get enough people to know what the truth is? Like, that was my biggest fear. It was like, if they're just, if we're under this guise, if not enough people know, 
Imagine if everyone does know that their government's evil, and then what happens next? Do they just go, well, everyone knows now, so now we don't really even have to hide it? Because trying to get everybody on board to actually make a stand on something is the most difficult thing to do. I mean, people like how their lives go. They have their routine set up. It's a lot for people to you know, protest and want to strike up. And I think with the number of people that just have a distrust in their government, I mean, there's a lot more people than there was back in 63. I mean, a lot more. The percentage has gone up way higher. But there's just a, like even COVID was a big thing for a lot of people. A lot of people just saw a lot of stuff go on where I still even if you're questioning, that's my whole goal is to make people question. But the idea, like if you find out your government is like this, like when me and you get in a conversation like this, we know what we're talking about because we're, we're both we, we're in on the information. We've seen the documents. We know the truth of that. But someone who's just an average listener who just was listening to Baby Shark or something and they hop into here and they're like, oh, my God, what is this conspiracy crap? And they turn it off. It's because they're not up to the speed. So I was like, how do we slowly get everyone up to the speed to take notice and take change? And what happens when that does happen? Well, By the way, it was the CIA in a memo back in the 60s who said that uh, charging people as conspiracy theorists was the most effect effective way of silencing them. So it began with the CIA. What's what does conspiracy mean? If you look at the word, uh, it's it's to whisper together. That's the uh, the root of that word. How do you think power operates? Do you think power goes out and tells people, oh, we're about to do this and that and so on? No, they talk behind closed doors. They talk quietly to each other, and they decide what policies and and who's to live and who's to die. And uh, you know how they're going to uh, remain in power. They talk quietly. They whisper together. That's what conspiracy means. That's how power operates. People in Europe know that. People in Europe I've talked to and the media in Europe covered the Kennedy assassination as, as if it was a conspiracy because that's what it was. They have a sense of history. They know how power functions. It's only people in America that are taught to be children. They're taught that, that we're children, but we're waking up. The children are waking up, and I think it's a good thing overall. But yes, this is a period of great danger and chaos. People believe anything now because they've been taught. Uh, now uh, they don't believe in the government anymore. They don't believe in any authorities, even when authorities tell them to do the right thing. They don't believe it anymore. So we live in a kind of uh, chaotic, anarchic world right now. And it's a dangerous world. I think some of the anger and fury on the right, I understand it. I understand January 6th, but I didn't uh, support it. I, I deplore it because I think it's dangerous. When you begin to overrun buildings and institutions and take violent uh, actions, I think it's a dangerous thing. I would like to see people mobilize against the powers in a peaceful way through organizing, through education like we're doing today and so on. I'd like to, the American people to say finally enough. We're not children. We want to know the truth. We have a right to our truth. And we can start by releasing the documents that the CIA still keeps from us against the law, against the GFK Act, which was passed back after Oliver's film, uh, back in the early 90s, 1992, I think it was passed, that compelled government agencies to release all documents related to the Kennedy presidency and his assassination. Well, the CIA is defying that law decades later. It's outrageous. And under President Trump, they were supposed to release these documents, and he went along with the CIA, the deep state, supposedly the great you know, uh, antagonist of the deep state, quickly caved to the CIA and kept the records secret. It's outrageous that we don't have a right to our own history. So we can begin by demanding this, saying enough. We're not children. We're grownups. We want a right, the right to our history. What do you think is hidden that they're trying to hide that's a threat to national security? I'll tell you one thing, because I, uh, uh, I tried to get it legally through the Freedom of Information Act. And I couldn't when I was researching my book. I wanted Bill Harvey's travel records. William Harvey, as I said earlier, is one of the key culprits uh, in the assassination of President Kennedy, a CIA official who hated the Kennedys, was on his way to Dallas, spotted by his deputy uh, in the weeks before the assassination. I want to know for sure whether he's on a plane going to Dallas in the weeks before the assassination. He was the chief of the CIA station in Rome at the time. What the hell was he doing going to Dallas. So they wouldn't release those records. They wouldn't release any of his travel records. 
I want to know where he was in the weeks before uh, the assassination of President Kennedy. So that's a key document that they're sitting on right now. When it comes to Lee Harvey Oswald, do you think it was Dulles that had him killed or do you think it was Dallas police? Because I always mention Dallas police, if you looked at it back then, they were all like no like openly KKK members that a lot of them were into some really dark stuff for the times, very corrupt things that a police officers wouldn't shouldn't be involved in, I would say, like involved in gangs. And what I noticed was like, I mean, imagine you have the per person who just killed the president allegedly in your custody. That's going to attract the eyes of the FBI, the CIA, the media. And I go, you probably want to get rid of this person as fast as possible. So I look at Dallas police when I think of someone that might have just paid to get Oswald out of the picture. Well, I think what's very intriguing, Lee Harvey Oswald's only phone call from the Dallas police uh, station where he was being held was to a military intelligence uh, official somewhere i think on the east coast when he made that phone call he didn't it wasn't successful by the way he wasn't not able to reach him i think that's who was his contact within the intelligence world that's the he rally saying, call right yes he was saying i'm i'm in trouble come help me i marchetti victor marchetti wrote uh, a book the cult of intelligence about the cia uh, a former cia official uh, thinks that he sealed his doom by making this call because they said he wasn't going along with uh, the uh, the narrative uh, which was he was solely responsible for killing the president. He was reaching out to his military intelligence contact and saying, come help me. I'm in trouble. They're, I'm in custody. They're trying to pin it on me. So as soon as they realized he was bucking the narrative, they had to kill him. So they sent a mafia errand boy, Jack Ruby, in to kill him. And Jack Ruby was starting to tell the full story to journalists like Dorothy Kilgallen. She ended up dead, dead of an overdose. A mysterious death, I must say. She said she was about to blow open the Kennedy case. Wait, that's uh, the lady that was sitting. They found her with a book that she had already read um, on, on her stomach or something like that. She was in her guest room sleeping. She had all her clothes on and her reading glasses were in the other room. Dorothy Kilgallen, for anyone my age, uh, is a no well-known journalist, was a well-known journalist. She was a syndicated columnist for the Hearst newspapers and also uh, a TV personality on shows like What's My Line and so on. Uh, she went down to the jailhouse to interview Jack Ruby after he was arrested. And he told her, apparently, according to her friends, the full story. She said she was about to blow open the case and she was found dead uh, before the, uh, she could publish her story. And the manuscript she was working on disappeared. She was found dead of an overdose. So I think they were silencing, as we said earlier, a number of people, dozens of people, I think, were killed in the 1960s and 70s who had inside information about the Kennedy case. There was, I think, Jim Marr's book, he talked about 120 something witnesses. But from what I've seen, the list wise, I can probably verify like 50 just on this, I guess, suspicious circumstances. I wouldn't go with the full 120 because it's like simple stuff. But there was stuff where it was like, dude had a heart attack, but then there was no autopsy where I was like, that's on your track record. That's just pro protocol. You're not following protocol because this person had to be linked in with the Kennedy assassination. Maybe he was a witness or something like that. Well, and then George DeMorenschild, who was obviously the minder for Lee Harvey Oswald, the CIA minder in Dallas, who was a wealthy man, an oil man. Uh, what the fuck was he doing? <laughs> and with Lee Harvey Oswald, who was an uneducated ex-Marine. Uh, you don't see that kind of class, uh, you know, crossover uh, among friendships. Uh, but he was his minder. He got to know him. And I think he was very guilty about playing a role, uh, unbeknownst to him, in setting up Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, and years later, he was about to go public. He was writing his own memoir, and he was found suicided in Florida with sh a shotgun blast. Uh, so I don't think, you know, he killed himself. I think someone else killed him to silence him. I think there were a number of suspicious deaths then. As I mentioned, the, uh, the uh, mafia gangsters who knew about the CIA plots against Kennedy and Castro, Gianni Roselli, Sam Giancana, both shot, executed, gangland style before they could testify to the House Assassinations Committee in the 1970s. Um, so a number of witnesses were uh, killed forever, starting with Lee Harvey Oswald. Do you think David Ferry was one? 
I think he was one too. I think David Ferry, George de Mornschild, Jean Roselli, Sam Jean Kana. I think these are some of the primary people who were silenced. They said a uh, throat shop, but then I watched like what the uh, they did a video with the police officer um, that apparently found him. And he talked about like, oh, what I think happened is he slipped and fell and hit his neck on a desk and caused that. But then he added at the ending, he goes, but his place did look like there was a struggle going on. So he could have been looking for like a pen. And I'm just like, I don't know what's I, I don't know what the law is anymore. If we're being lied to like that. I mean, saying that's not suspicious or saying that is suspicious. That's not crazy. And then people that's what I don't like about, like the idea of like the control with media and everything. I don't care if you say we can't give you this information because then I know it exists. But when you make people insane by saying we don't know what you're talking about or something of that sort or no results found, then people go mad and they start going through like schizophrenia stages where they feel like, you know, people are watching them and all this type of stuff. That's what scares me is that the manipulation of the mind. And we see that with MK Ultra as well, too. And, and why are they doing this 60 years later? Why are they still covering up? Of course, all the original people are, are long dead. Uh, why is a whole new generation of people in the national security world uh, still uh, so adamant about uh, keeping the truth from the American people about President Kennedy? Because I think if it came out that the CIA killed the president, this charming, popular, handsome prince, king, uh, I think there would be actually a wave of revulsion, even more revulsion against the CIA at that point, even though it's led now by completely different people and, of course, uh, staffed by different people. I think the institution itself would come under so much fire uh, for having been complicit with this. And, of course, Alan Dulles was no longer officially head of the CIA, but he was acting as if he were. And, of course, deputy his deputies, who still worked at the CIA, were reporting to him as I said earlier, and were involved in the conspiracy and the cover-up. So uh, yes, I think there would be, even 60 years later, uh, as I say, a national wave of revulsion against the CIA, and it would be entirely appropriate. You know, President Kennedy tried to break up the CIA even uh, in, while he was serving in the White House. He had Arthur Schlesinger, among others, uh, you know, come up with new names for the CIA. Uh, maybe they would divide it into different different uh, institutions, uh, uh, you know, intelligence gathering institution, action operations arm and so on. He wanted to put it directly under his control or the State Department's control. Uh, he was worried about the CIA acting, uh, you know, in a rogue banner. President Truman, who authorized the CIA back in 1947 when he was president, later came to regret it, thought it was becoming a, quote, a Gestapo, which was his chief fear about the CIA. And he wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post just weeks after the assassination, saying the CIA was out of control. Well, I write about this in the Devil's Chessboard. Uh, Alan Dulles, who was no longer a CIA director, but was threatened by this, went down to Missouri to see a retired Harry Truman and try to talk him out of the op-ed that he had written already and published in the Washington Post, saying he, uh, you know, uh, but he couldn't do it. The old man was stubborn. Truman was stubborn. So what did Dulles do? The next best thing was to go and change the uh, written record. So in the files of the CIA, he said he went, he flew down to Missouri, and the old man told him, oh, yes, he didn't know what he was doing. Uh, an aide had written the op-ed, and he was kind of out of it and old, and he didn't realize it. So he lied. In other words, Dulles lied for the official record about what Harry Truman really felt. But what he really felt, like a number of world leaders at the time, Harry Truman, President de Gaulle, and so on, knew the truth, suspected the truth, knew that it was a conspiracy, knew that President Kennedy had been killed for a reason, for national security reasons, and were alarmed that the CIA was out of control. I think if you blow the doors open to the JFK assassination, the fear is that it doesn't just stop with JFK. You end up finding out about RFK, MLK, and all this major stuff where it's a force that's just not been controlled or not been monitored as it should have been um, just going rogue. I mean, I always point like the Kennedy assassination. That's the turning point. You can mark every single thing that happens afterwards, Watergate, whatever you want to say. And it's because they got away with it by the skin of their teeth. You know, and you don't just stop doing something that you get away with. You evolve it. You try and find ways to perfect it. And it's gone from manipulating overseas populations that I don't agree with either. But now it's also manipulating us as well, too. And well, that's you, 
you put your finger on. I think another reason why they're so afraid of the truth coming out of it, President Kennedy is it, it will lead to a, a, a inquiries and questions about other assassinations in the 1960s, including, as you say, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, uh, and so on. Uh, you know, Fred Hampton, we saw the movie uh, recently that came out about Fred Hampton, the young Black Panther later in Chicago, and he was killed in his bed after being drugged by a death squad from the FBI and the Chicago Police Department. So, uh, you know, they were enforcing their power at the point of a gun in the 1960s and 70s. And that could happen today. If if your generation were bold enough, as I've argued in my latest book, to I'm create trying. leaders, <laughs> leaders who could effectively mobilize you and make a difference politically, then they would come after them too. They would the same way. I think we need to do a much better job of protecting our leaders if we have any, if we have any men, women, whatever, who are bold enough to take charge, to lead, and do it in a responsible way, then I think they'll come after them too. You know, I interviewed uh, Black Panther leader Bobby Seale, and they came after him. It's amazing. It's a miracle that he wasn't killed too during that period. They wanted to kill him. Uh, and they did try to kill, him, of course, his uh, partner, Huey Newton, uh, several times. And, uh, you know, that's the way they operated in the 1960s. They silenced the most effective, most talented, most charismatic leaders we had. The Kennedy brothers, Martin Luther King, uh, the Black Panther leaders, uh, they targeted these people. And we were sadly inept about protecting them. Or we went along with, oh, it's another crazy lone gunman. How many crazy lone gunmen do you have in this country running around who are able to get the kind of access uh, to these leaders, our leaders that they had. It's ridiculous that, that, that we kept believing their lies one after the other. We should have gotten to the bottom of the, ke of the Kennedy case much sooner, but we did finally. It was a national security operation. And if you don't believe that, you believe in fairy tales. If you believe Lee Harvey Oswald killed President Kennedy on his own, then you believe in a fairy tale. A fairy tale that helps you maybe sleep uh, a little sounder each night. But that's not the truth. We all know the real, real truth. Well, David, I really appreciate you for giving me your time to do the podcast. Is there a place where people can find any of your links and where they can find your books as well, too? Yeah, I'm on Facebook uh, several times a week. Uh, and I also have my own blog, which is uh, the, the, the David Talbot Show. Uh, so you can check out my writing there. Well, I'll make sure I link it all in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting and thanks for listening to this episode.